uh, the week before that, we had come as far as Revelation chapter 12. We made it down through verse 10. And so this morning, we're going to go back and pick up our study there. We're going to kind of do a little review, a couple of update things before we uh, dive into the text. Um, But if you remember, as we moved into chapter 12, and you remember the rules too, this will help me know if you're with me in this, we saw the woman, the child, and the dragon. How many of you remember that? Good, that's most of you, the woman, the child, and the dragon. And as we went through that, we, we could determine by scripture that the woman is the nation of Israel. And so we saw the woman, the nation of Israel there. We also saw that the child then must be and is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. We know that. Yes. Okay. And so it was kind of obvious to us because verse nine actually told us that the dragon then was Satan himself. So we, we know these things. We saw these things and it was very clear to us. And to some degree, this kind of exposed, uh, if you will, the uh, saga that's been going on through the years between Satan and what he's been trying to do and kind of reveals the enemy's tactics a little, a little bit more. And we know uh, that we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. The Bible tells us that. We often see what, uh, understand what he's doing, but we're not always clear as to where he is specifically targeting uh, at the time. When I was a boy, uh, growing up in Northampton County um, and rural county on the farm, I was always battling snakes for some reason. In fact, if my mom shows up at one of these services a day, she can tell you about, she's got a snake story that involves me. Um, but one of my snake stories was that my dog and I were chasing the snake and we chased this snake into a bush. We couldn't get him. So the snake's in this bush, this thorn bush. I mean, this is who I am. So just bear with me. And so he's in the thorn bush and he pops his head up every now and then, but we couldn't get him. I'm, I got my BB gun. I'm trying to pop him. My dog's trying to get at him, but he can't stick his head in the bush because of the thorns. So we can't get at this snake, you know? And so I'm like, well, let me throw a stick on that side and make him pop up on this side so I can hit him with my BB gun. He's in there. We know he's there, but we actually couldn't determine his location. What this chapter has done for us, it's exposed part of what Satan has been doing and focusing on throughout the history of man. Because in Genesis chapter 3, God told Satan on the day that Adam sinned and God dealt with everybody involved, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he says, in your seat will bruise his heel, but he shall bruise your head. Y'all remember this. I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing without it in front of me. And from that point on, as I told you last time, Satan uh, determined within himself that he would destroy the seed of the woman, the woman herself technically, or prevent by corrupting the seed of the earth from any seed coming from her that could be the redeemer. And so, therefore, we see him throughout time doing this throughout the New Test- the Old, uh, Old Testament, starting in Genesis chapter 6, as we don't fully understand everything that went on there, but clearly Satan was trying to corrupt the seed of the earth enough to prevent the promised seed from coming into the world. And every time God was doing a work with the woman that looked like the Redeemer was coming, Satan rallied to destroy it. We see him doing that. And it's the ones I mentioned to you last time was in Egypt when the deliverer was about to be born to lead them out of slavery. Moses, that Satan had Pharaoh throw all the baby boys into the Nile River. We see it as Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. Satan has Herod throw, uh, kill many of the boys in Bethlehem from age two down. We've seen that through time. And even as Israel is coming back together in the last days, scripture being fulfilled, God says in the last days, I will bring you back. I will flourish you. The dry bones will come to life. As Ezekiel says, Satan rallies through Hitler to destroy millions of the Jews to prevent them from being where they actually are today. And he's been doing that throughout time. And so therefore we know, not being ignorant of his devices, that he is actually trying to do that right now as we can see very, very clearly today more than ever before what he's up to to some degree. Israel right now being distracted because they're excited about the peace 
that's being negotiated throughout the Middle East with the Abraham Accord. Of course, we know that. Um, yet Satan is rallying, just like Scripture says, Persia, Iran, along with the north, Turkey, with the aid of Russia and others, and there will be a war that will come. And so we can see the enemy clearer today than we've been able to in the past, in my opinion. This may be because it's the beginning of God lifting his hand of restraining. And it may also be for us in America that we are living in a land that God has protected, but is finally entering into the final hour, which will even bring judgment upon America. And so we know right now, according to Open Doors, that 260 million Christians are persecuted for their faith worldwide. All over the world, you can look at Christians are persecuted. In Russia, I'm sorry, in, uh, well, in Russia as well, but in China, unless you go along with the narrative of the Communist Party, you can't meet as a Christian church. And many Christians have been persecuted, churches burned, uh, Christians have been killed throughout the Middle East, all over. You can look at that stuff at your own time. Our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, I keep getting reports of Christians being killed in Nigeria, churches being burned, pastors being killed, Islam uh, kidnapping and raping women. Um, all over the world, we see that. And so finally, as America, we've been living in Disneyland. We see it begin to creep into America into a different degree than we thought. Grace Community Church is a good example in California, and where John MacArthur is pastor. They have been utilizing a parking lot for almost as long as I have been living, for 45 years since 1975. Grace Community Church leased a large portion of his parking lot from the county. I believe it's Los Angeles County. Um, and now for unspecified reasons, the county's public works department has given the church until October 1st to vacate the lot. And there's been a lot of turmoil within, uh, between them and the court system there, all because uh, the church there refused to uh, shut down any longer as many other pastors throughout that state are doing the same thing. And even one church that I know of, which is meeting not in person in the building, but in home fellowships throughout, have had police called on them by neighbors in the community because they are gathering, even on their youth group, because they're gathering in smaller groups. Um, you could, could never think that that could potentially happen in our country, all because of a highly politicized pandemic, which has been blown out of proportion uh, and politicized to create fear in order to then be able to use that as a cover for control. And here's what the CDC just said to us this week. Uh, and I'm just going to read this. This was the text above the graphics, and it was labeled uh, comorbidities, comorbid which is pre-existing conditions, I believe. And it says table three shows the types, listen carefully, and then I'll explain. Table three shows the type of health conditions and, con and contributing causes mentioned in conjunction with deaths involving coronavirus disease. It says for 6% of the deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned. For deaths with conditions or causes in addition to COVID-19, on average, there were 2.6 additional conditions or causes per death. And then it goes on to have some stuff. So let me make that clear because I, I kind of like numbers. Um, so what it basically means is 94% of everybody that died from COVID-19 actually didn't die from COVID-19, but they died from the other health issues they have, which made it difficult for them to fight the COVID-19. Um, and in fact, 26 other conditions on average, and those conditions are all kinds of things, heart disease, diabetes, all of those things. And what it means is that 94% of the people that have died, died because they were unhealthy and unable to fight the disease off. The other 6%, it said only COVID-19, and most of them were older and a little frail. Um, and so 99.99% of the population um, would never succumb to COVID-19. In fact, if you take the 180-something thousand people who have died and divide it by the 330 million people, uh, people that we have, it's uh, a percentage of 0 0.0005. Um, very, very little. And I won't play with those numbers with you because I don't want to focus on that. It does say that for people who are unhealthy, which is the real issue, 
They need to be careful and we need to be concerned because they won't be able to fight it off. Now, with that said, I had a face-to-face conversation yesterday with a 66-year-old man, which I've known for for a while, who just got over COVID-19, but his wife didn't get it from him. And that's hard for me to understand. I know three households personally where one spouse had it and the other people in the house didn't get it. And I, and I just don't understand with the importance placed on mask, how that can be. However, this 66 year old man who is just an an old Southern guy who's outside doing something all all the time, never had any issues except one day when he was moving heavy equipment and finally got winded a little bit and sat down and he had never felt winded before. And that's where he said, okay, this must be my body, you know, having some difficulty with it. His wife never got it. His 80 something year old mother got it. And she had no problems. She rolled over one night with a little pain. But other than that, she got through it. I know a pastor who has it. And I just, I've talked with him several times this week. And he's in his 30s. And he said, well, I'll put it like this. It is not as bad as the flu, but it's difficult. And I wouldn't want anybody older to have it. He had a fever for a couple of days. And um, then he had a couple of days of difficult breathing, especially when the medication was wearing off. And so conversation after conversation after conversation, I'm hearing these things and I'm reading things and I'm just a numbers guy and the numbers just don't add up. But the same people who use this to tell the church that it can't meet and shouldn't meet are the same people that will pass a bill that will allow an adult person to have sex with a minor and not have to be labeled a sex offender as well as want to legalize certain drugs, like what we talked about back in Revelation chapter 9. So on and on and on it goes. The level of deception and immorality and sin. And with all of that, I'm looking at the great American church that sent missionaries around the world and has done so much And the whole world, all the churches of the world are looking at the American church. And in this possible final hour of the church, I ain't going to be the one to drop the baton and shut the church down. That doesn't make any sense. And this time, more than ever before, we need this. We need one another. We need to be able to encourage one another. And I think that for me... We need to be wise about all the things that we hear and we see, and we need to pray, and as we'll see today, we need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. So now with all that said, let's go to our text. Let's read now. For the sake of context, we're going to start reading at verse 7 down through verse 12, but I'm probably only going to cover in detail um, verse 11, (laughs) but we'll get through verse 12. So if you're with me there at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, please say amen. Amen. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was their place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and The kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, for today that we can stand and sit and be in this place together, Lord God, to worship you, uh, Lord God, to be fed your word, to fellowship and encourage one another. Lord God, to be able to do what you've called us to do. 
And so we're thankful for that, Lord. We praise you for it. And now we ask that you would remove the cares of this life from our hearts and our minds and the distractions from this room, Lord, that we would hear what you have to say, Lord God, that we would not be moved by any man's opinions, not Pastor Kevin's, but Lord, by what your word is instructing us to do, that we may follow you in these times. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, So we are overcomers, if I gave it a title. We are true overcomers is what I might would call this. And it's important for us to understand what it means to be an overcomer, to understand that one of the things that we kind of got to do is understand that there are some false teachings that bring confusion, um, such as uh, millennialism, such as dominion theology, such as prosperity gospel, which all have hints of one another tied in dominion theology. I'm sorry, a, a millennialism first, it, it, it kind of means that they believe that we're in the kingdom now, that, that the kingdom of God was inaugurated as Christ, at Christ's resurrection, and so that the kingdom now is already here. And with dominion theology, they take it as far as to believe because of that, the church uh, should have dominion in every aspect of human life today. Uh, and also then with prosperity gospel, they take it a step further to say then we should be able to have authority over the things uh, in this kingdom and we should have health and wealth and success at all times. And so that's what they kind of believe, which all kind of goes against scripture because when, when Pilate asked Jesus, was he a king? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. My kingdom is not of this world. And when, when talking to the church in John 15, he says, look, the world is going to hate you. But you know what? The world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. And he says, look, in this life, you will have tribulation in the world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And even when Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he says, pray that thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because the kingdom that Jesus is king over is the kingdom of heaven, which he will bring to earth at his return. So a lot of people who want to claim to be overcomers sometimes are looking at it from that perspective. And I want us to say, well, see what it really means to be an overcomer as we go into this. And as we look at this in verse 11, look at it with me, it says, and they overcame. Well, the they who overcame, I want to make sure I know who is the they and where are the they. And the they that overcame are the they in verse 10, if you notice with me, I heard a loud voice saying, in, in heaven, now salvation is strength, is strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him. And it's very interesting as we look at this that the day in verse 11 is the day in verse 10 who had previously been accused by the accuser who is Satan day and night and they are already there in heaven and it's the same they that are told to rejoice in verse 12 who are in heaven as in verse 12 he makes a distinction between those who are in heaven who have overcome and those are on, who are still on earth he says woe to them do you catch that distinction y- y'all okay Okay, so the they who have overcome are the they who are in heaven. And remember, at this point, as we read through chapter 12, we are midway in the tribulation, which began in chapter 6. And at this point, the church, that means you and I, is already in heaven. We haven't seen the church on earth since the beginning of chapter 4 when John was caught up. We don't see the church on earth until Jesus returns in chapter 19. And so we believe it seems at this point that the church is in heaven and it's the church and all believers who are in heaven who are rejoicing and who have been claimed those who have overcome Satan and the flesh which is good news. Amen? Amen. So that is a wonderful thing for us to begin to fathom. Now look, what does this word overcome actually mean? Well, listen to me carefully. This word in the Greek, if you're taking notes and you're using a Strong's Concordance in your own time, is G3528 or the Greek Strong's number 3528, which is nikeo, nikeo, and it literally means, listen, it means, it's translated several times, overcome, obviously, conquer, prevail, or get the victory. I like that one. It means get the victory. 
How many of y'all want to get the victory? I want to get the victory over the enemy and over my flesh. And so it literally means those who have got the victory. It speaks of Christians that hold fast, listen, their faith uh, even unto death against the power of their foes, which is Satan himself and the temptation of the flesh. Satan and his persecution, the world's persecution, the flesh temptation, all of those things, they have gotten the victory over that, which is what we desire. Now, side note. The, the root of this is part of the compound word used in chapter 2 and 3, Nicolaitans, which means to conquer the laity. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, those who have conquered the general population of the Christian church. I just want to mention that to you. That's a side note. And what it spoke of, remember, Jesus says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Y'all remember that? I hate the deeds of those who have victory or have conquered over the laity or the, or the general brethren of the church. Well, Why? Well, because Jesus doesn't want anyone ruling over or lording over his church because the organization chart for the church is what we call a flat organization chart, meaning that it's Jesus Christ and in the church. There's no hierarchy within the church. There is no priesthood or rulership within the Christian church. There is no vicar of Christ who can sit on a throne on earth and be a part of the Christian church. And before we go further in the book of Revelation, we should understand that. Y'all caught that, right? Those of you who used to be Catholic probably caught it very quickly, okay? So, no, no, none of that exists. But what this verse exposes for us, this is the good thing. This verse is telling us something that we need to consider. Verse 11, let's read it again. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of, of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. What is it saying to us? Well, it's telling us that believers can and have victory over Satan and his kingdom and the world and flesh that we can have the victory and it actually hints towards or tells us in what way we have the victory in what way we have overcome listen you want to get the victory the verse gives you three ways let's look at the verse again it says and they overcame him number one by the blood of the lamb you see that number two by the word of their testimony and number three that they didn't love their lives to the death so we're going to spend most of our time on those three things as we dive into this the first one is they overcame him by the blood of the lamb i call it this the three things his blood our testimony and our sacrifice that's how we overcome. First one is his blood. Look at it with me again. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Now, this is something that is very, very, uh, very intimate. It's, it's very amazing to even begin to fathom. That the innocent and perfect lamb being offered as a picture of the promise and the powerful work of our God to redeem us has been put forth from the beginning and we have seen it throughout. And when we think about the fact that the Bible says that God chose us before the foundation of the world in Christ, that he predestined us in Christ for the, for before the foundation of the world, means that God's wisdom is so amazing that he could think about the whole thing before it began and plan it out perfectly. It's not that God just stands outside of time so that he could see the beginning from the end. He has foreknowledge. That's a big part of it. But the fact that he then purposed in himself how he was going to accomplish it, that he would create a law which would require blood and then offer himself, the father offering him son, the son offering himself, the Holy Spirit working in the midst of it as that sacrifice in a human body experiencing all the pain and humiliation. And he planned that from the beginning. It's hard to fathom this, but he did. And so while his children were slaves in Egypt, he brought the word to them and he said, Moses, I want you to institute something new. And this is something that God was excited about because as he's uh, laying out the plagues to, uh, to against Egypt, he gives them this one and he pauses after the ninth plague. And he says, the tenth one is special to me. So here's what I want you to do. And I want you to always do this. This is going to be something new for you. You're going to, every year about this time, you're going to get a lamb. You're going to bring that lamb. Well, you're going to make sure that lamb is perfect. First, you're going to look over this lamb. He's got to be a perfect lamb, okay? No spot, no blemish. He can't, he can't be like, you know, one eye, three legs. He can't be the worst one. He's got to be the best one. And you're going to bring him into your house. And, and he's going to hang out for four days in your house. 
And if you have children, you know that this is a problem. When we talked about it, my, my wife and my kids, about, you know, getting some animals, goats and stuff, and I got excited till I realized that they like them because they're cute. And I'm thinking at some point with the way the world is, I'm going to kill this thing, you know? <laughs> and they're like, whoa, dad. But this is what they did for four days, the animals in the house. And you know what children do. They begin to ride on its back. They begin to pull its ears and hug it. And then they give it a name. And God actually gave the, the lamb a name. He called him my son, Yahshua, Jehovah's salvation. That's his name. And he says, you take it in there for four days. And, and then, you know, on this certain day of this month, you're going to kill it at twilight. But it's not any uh, kind of meal like any other meal you've ever had. In this meal, you need to be dressed with your staff and your sandals on in case you're going to get out quick because it's a picture of my deliverance. And what you're going to do is you got to eat all of it. It can't be raw. It has to be cooked properly, and you have to eat the whole thing, which means that if you ain't got enough folks in your family to eat the whole lamb, then you got to get some more folks together so that the lamb is completely consumed. And, and you got to take the blood of the lamb and apply it to the, bo- the door p- the post and the mantle because I am going to pass over the land and I'm going to kill the firstborn. It's the final plague. And I'm going to pass over every home that has applied in obedience the blood to the doorpost. Now, I'm not going to say for the home of the prominent person who's well-known or very successful I'm going to pass over, but the poor I'm going to forget. I'm only looking for the blood. It's not that I'm only going to pass over the house of the people who've been really, really good, but the ones who, you know, the ex-cons and the, and the folks that's been problems, and you know, hey, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to visit them and take their first. No, I'm only looking for the blood because all of you are sinners, and I'm teaching you something that's only going to be the blood. And so that night, God passed through Egypt. And he passed over every house that had applied the blood. You follow? You know the picture, obviously. And so, and here it says we overcome by the blood. In other words, it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And see, here's the picture. He's been trying to give them this picture from from all of us, not just Israel, but all of us see this picture. This blood represents the ultimate and only fulfillment of the law. This blood ties all of the biblical pictures together that God has given in the law. And the shadow that was concealed in the Old Testament has now been revealed in the New Testament. I want to read to you what it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. It says this, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. They were doing it out of obedience, but it wasn't doing the perfect work that could only be done in Christ. It goes on to say, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. In other words, if they made you perfect, then we would have never ceased to offer them. When the writer was writing this, we, we realized we don't need this any longer. He goes on to say, for the worshipers once purified would have no, no more conscious of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible, the writer says, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It was a picture. So he says, therefore... When he came into the world, Jesus, he said, sacrifices and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. You ever thought about this? Jesus was God before the world began. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. His body was created to be a sacrifice. A body you have prepared for me and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Can you believe that? Jesus says, I come in the volume of the book. He's written on every page of the Bible. It's all about Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, who would come and die for our sins and redeem us and resurrect us on the third day, and he would come again and receive us to himself. It's all been pointing to him. Jesus is the only one that can fulfill this. So when it says that, and they overcame, who? They who? Those who are in heaven, the church, us, the body of believers, we overcome by the blood of the lamb because blood is required to be shed to pay for sin 
In the Old Testament, it was temporary, as we just read in the book of Hebrews. Every morning, every evening, there were the sacrifices. Once per year, there was a day of atonement where the high priest could go in the holy place that once after sacrificing for himself and getting right, because if he went in wrong, he would die, and they would have to pull him out, get another priest. And God already had a list of who's supposed to go in. But every time a believer wanted to get right, they had to bring a sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle or the door of the temple. And at the door, they had to take the sacrifice, which had already been inspected. And then they had to take the knife in their own hand as the priest held the bowl and they had to slit the animal's throat and the blood would bleed out into the bowl. And the priest would take the bowl and he would sprinkle the blood, bring in purification. And so all of these pictures and types we see and they saw and they had to experience And so it's this blood of Jesus that's also important. Romans tells us, chapter 3, verse 25, it tells us this, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. It says here, he was set forth a a propitiation. That means an appeasement, uh, a substitutionary appeasement for the punishment and the wrath of God against sin. Jesus went and took that upon himself so that we wouldn't have to. And he did that by his blood upon the cross. And so we see that Romans 5, 9 says, much more than having been justified by his blood. We've been justified by the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, justified, we always say, means just as if I never sinned, right? So in other words, I've been justified because of the blood of Jesus, which means that when I stand before a holy God, he sees me as if I had never sinned because just like back in the Old Testament when he was passing through, he sees the blood and that's all that matters. So when he sees my my life, and if you believe and he sees your life, only the blood of his son, which Peter says we've been sprinkled with in the sanctification process. And so spiritually speaking, you've been sprinkled just like the priest would purify things by sprinkling it. Your life has been sprinkled by the blood of Christ. And that's how you can stand before God. And he sees that you place your faith in the Passover lamb, his son. And he sees you just as if you never sinned. That's hard to swallow because you're going to stand before him remembering your sin. You're going to, look, you a Christian, you will stand at the great white throne judgment and you will see people being sentenced to eternal damnation and cast into the lake of fire. And at that moment, you'll realize I overcame by the blood because I should be going in the fire with them. I'm a sinner like them. Some of them are better than me by my estimation, yet they're going into the lake of fire for all eternity. And I'm standing before a holy God clothed in white because I overcame, not because I'm good religiously, not because of my own righteousness, not because of any good that's in me or anything I could ever do, but because of his blood. Then it becomes clear to us. That's why John says that love will be perfected on that day. And then we realize, you know, not only that, he purchased us with it. The Bible says in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, I'm sorry. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. What does it mean? Redemption, to be purchased back. That what was lost. We, we We were lost because of sin, but we've been purchased back to God. And the price that was paid to purchase us was Jesus' blood. Amen? He purchased us with his blood. And so we haven't been purchased with anything earthly, anything, any kind of metals and gold and all that kind of stuff. I know some of you are getting gold now. Um, no, but we've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we, we, can't, we get the victory through his blood. That's why the worship leader chose the song, why should I gain from his reward? He's the one that did all the work. He's the one that did everything. I get the victory that he won for me by his blood. So I overcame that way. Not only do I overcome by his blood, but I also overcome, notice it says in verse 11 again, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony is very interesting. There's a lot that we could look at with this. The word testimony 
is, uh, if you also take a note, it's Greek in the, in the concordance, Greek 3141 in the strong, it, it means, well, the word is actually in the Greek, maturio, maturia, excuse me, maturia. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's root is where we get the word martyr. We, we know that. It's often uh, translated witness, uh, things of that sort as well. But here, this particular rendering of it, this particular uh, meaning of it actually means Report, record or report, or testimony or witness. It's those two uh, implications being made. A, a record of something and a, re, and a witness of something, a testimony of something. It speaks of evidence, evidence of our faith. Listen, we know that James said, the Bible tells us, uh, actually Hebrews says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, and, and, and for by it, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2, the elders obtained a good testimony. James is the one that tells us that he could show his faith by his works, which all implies, if you will, that part of our testimony is literally the life we now live in Jesus Christ because Jesus has done a new and fresh work in us and it causes us to live a certain way. Are you following me? So therefore, part of the testimony is literally the report that's given of those who actually see us and observe what we're doing, which speaks of the fact that, listen, the fact that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and he's poured his spirit out into your heart causes you, if you will, to be different than you used to be. And it's evident. It can be seen. It's not just something that we say. It's literally something that we live. And we know that to be the case because we see the, the reasons why we gather in times like this is because he's done something in us. And we know we need more than ever to be with one another in fellowship so that we can encourage one another. Y'all know that, right? You know that the scripture says that we are not to forsake the gathering. We know that, right? Y'all know that. Hebrews chapter 10, but we are to exhort one another more and more as we see the day approaching. You know what that implies? That we can see the day approaching. First of all, that's what it implies. It means literally as Christians, born of the spirit, having the word, checking out uh, of CNN and stuff like that, and looking at the word and praying and spending time with the Lord and being around one another, we literally can sense and see that the day of the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing near. We, we've been taught through scripture, we've been led of the Holy Spirit to be sensitive to these things. So then what the scripture is saying is, as we can see that they're approaching, this needs to happen more, not less, because we need it more, you know? And so this is the thing that we got to understand. It, it's this testimony is how we live and how we feel and what we desire, which is above and beyond the things of this life. But it's not just that. It's because of that that he's done in us that our testimony is also a vocal testimony, or a, I should say a declared testimony in some way. Psalm chapter 107, verse 2 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He goes on to say, who has redeemed us from the hand of the enemy and gathered us out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south? Uh, they wandered in the wilderness in desolate ways. Speaking of Israel, they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. <laughs> this is what he did. It's a declaration of the truth. This is, the, this is what has happened. And it says, and he led them forth by the right way, and that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Go to a city for a dwelling place. I love that because Hebrews says that those who walk by faith are looking for a city that's not made with hands. It says, oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. This psalm is beautiful because it, it, it kind of moves us to declare that which we believe, that which we've seen, and that which we've experienced. It kind of pushes us to the place where we no longer have this quiet faith, but in times of trouble, we have a faith that we declare, and we will declare it more and more, and it, it kind of encourages me 
to be vocal now more than more and, and bolder about my faith wherever I go to encourage people, to be willing to, to say to people, because look, more than ever before, and this is real, if you ain't sensed it yet, you might need to pay attention. More than ever before, people desire some real hope because without, listen, without Jesus, there is no hope. And when the church leaves, there will be no evidence of hope. And then the world will be in trouble. While we're here, we need to declare the hope we have and what hope really is. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, it's very interesting. We know it, 8 through 10, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Whoa, isn't that powerful? The word is near in my mouth and in my heart. Not that I think this would ever happen before we get out of here, but if they take this away, they, they look, they ain't took everything away because a lot of it's stored up now. It can't, and see, here's the crazy thing I know to be true because when, when God uses me to talk to people, sometimes he brings things back that I don't really even remember exactly where to find it in this, but I know the vicinity, but he brings it back clearly when I need it. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, hey, don't, don't even take thought for that day when they deliver you up. I will give you in the very hour what you have to say. These are the kind of things that the Lord has said to, to the church throughout time. And so he says, the word, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And he says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which is the completeness of the, of the gospel message, you will be saved. Remember the gospel. Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and raised on the third day. Uh, that's what Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 15. That's the whole gospel, right? Amen? Our Jesus ain't in the grave, right? He rose on the third day. Critical. And it says here, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Listen, we should live it. And then when necessary and more and more in these days, we should declare it openly and vocally. Amen? Amen. Because here's the thing that I believe. When I declare boldly my faith, it has a powerful effect on me. When I declare boldly and openly my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan loses some of his power against me at that very moment. Because I've simply declared as I'm surrendering that Jesus is Lord. And, and that's the end of it. I, I've been telling you, I've been saying this more and more and more. I need to go into t-shirt business. <laughs> Every time I come up with something, I want to wear it. I want to declare it, you know. Because God is good. Testimony. The Pharisees harassed a man who had been blind. And they said... How did, how, what happened to you? What is this about? This man is a sinner. And he says, look, I don't know all of that. I just know whereas I was blind, and now I see. And I've already told you the man that did this to me. His name is Jesus. But you figure the rest out on your own. I love that, the blind man. The blind man and the thief on the cross. I love it because they didn't know nothing but Jesus. And it was enough. Not that we should stay there. We should grow. But it, that, that childlike faith. So finally, not just his sacrifice and our, uh, excuse me, his blood and our testimony, but also we overcome by our sacrifice. Look at verse 11 again as we've got to wrap this up. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And number three, and they did not love their lives to the death. And that's a very interesting one. They did not love their lives to the death. What is he saying about this one because it, it, you got to understand that as we look at the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 there's a common theme that goes through there of not loving their lives to the death in other words it means that Jesus is saying that we need to have a very light touch of the things of this world now I'm going to run through some things and I want you to listen very carefully write it down if you're taking notes because sometimes this faith, this walk to be an overcomer will bring division in your life. And Jesus gives it to us in Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 34, where Jesus says, Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. 
you would think Jesus came to bring peace on earth, right? Well, ultimately in his kingdom, yes. But in this, this time, no. He came that we may have peace with him when we receive him, amen? He left his peace with us so that we who believe can experience it. But as it relates to the world and those of the world who don't know him, not so much. He goes on to say, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Now, he's not saying that we should seek enemies or to have enemies, but he's saying that this is something that's going to happen and we're going to face it and we need to prepare. He says in verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And then he ends it with this. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is warning us that we need to surrender to him and focus on him and follow him. And there are going to be times and situations where that's going to cause division and friction. And the way to handle that is to follow Jesus regardless and pray for those around us and be a witness. But sometimes division will come. And if you try, listen, if you want to, for the sake of what you think love is, neglect Christ to try to hold on to that, then you're going to lose it anyway. But if you, and, and this is true, this is true because what happens in that situation, listen very carefully, parents especially, and even spouses, what happens, and I've seen it, when you compromise on Jesus so that you won't lose this person, they will see your faith is not real and you won't gain anything. It's, it's, and it doesn't make sense, but that's the way it works. Jesus is saying, don't compromise on me as you're praying for and loving them that they can see something real. Because here's the thing. If your child is walking away from the Lord or your spouse is walking away from the Lord and they see you talking about the Lord, but you're compromising, you have no witness. Your report's bad. But if you are walking with the Lord and you stay with the Lord as you tell them, hey, he loves you and you need to walk with him. Then when they get in trouble and it gets tough, they can look back to the real witness that they saw in you and maybe turn to him. But compromising doesn't work. Jesus says the division is natural. You can't avoid it because it's not you, it's him. You understand that? Well, not only that, Jesus keeps saying it. He says it over and over through the Gospels. Matthew 16, he says it this way. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says, look, if you want to come out to me, take up your cross, endure whatever, and follow me. Because if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it anyway. But if you lose it, you'll find it. Jesus, this is crazy stuff you're talking. But he's saying every time you think that it, you can hold on to whatever you're doing and, and neglect him, and, you know, and you're holding on to that, you're going to lose it anyway. It's all going to burn. Naked we came into the world. Naked we're going to leave. You best hold on to Jesus as you see things getting tougher, as you see the day approaching. He said the same thing in Luke's gospel, chapter 17, this way. He says, in that day, he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife, Jesus said? Oh, my Lord. Remember Lot's wife? She had a lot to lose. That, that was good. Dang. I never think about this stuff. I got to write, write that one down. All right. That was pretty good. All right. <laughs> See, Jesus is funnier than I am. I didn't even get it. He said, remember Lot's wife? He said, you know, because think about it. Her children were there. All her prized possessions were there. She had the brand new granite countertops. Um, <laughs> just got the patio done. <sighs> and he says right after that in the very next verse, because whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. 
And he goes on to say, I tell you, and that night there'll be two men in the same bed. One will be taken, the other one left. The two women grinding in and in the mill together. One will be taken, the other one will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other one will be left. Jesus says, focus on me. One more time, John chapter 12, verse 25. Jesus says it this way. He says, and Jesus answers saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus was saying that he was kind of the picture of his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus saying, just like when you put a piece of dead seed in the ground, it bursts forth and then you get a bunch of fruit from one little dead grain, you can get ears of corn on one stalk, okay? Um, and, and, and then you got a whole field next year. Jesus saying, likewise, my simple life, my, my life going into the ground, into the grave will burst forth in, in resurrection and then look at all the fruit. It's just a little bit of it right here. You get the picture? So Jesus was saying this and then he goes on to say, and he says it right after that. He says, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world We'll keep it for all eternity. And if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Jesus says, let it go. You see, because I, I have to be honest with you. I haven't lost anything in 2020 in a, in a, in a, in, or, or since I've been following Jesus. I've let the world go. I'm done with the world. So this year, nothing that's changed for me. Everybody struggling because they love this life and they love the world so therefore they desire the old normal and I can understand that and I've lost nothing this year because I'm still living my normal my normal is I'm worshiping Jesus I'm walking with Jesus and I'm gathering as often I can with the people of Jesus ain't nothing changed for me the world can go to hell in a handbasket which it is <laughs> I don't mean that in any kind of disrespectful way Nothing's going to change for me for eternity because I've already found my normal. So it's not going to change. Jesus said that over and over and over. So let's end in verse 12. He says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. And that's where we are in this context. We are rejoicing. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. So when we come back together next week, we'll pick it up in verse 12 actually, and, and cover that a little bit and then work through. One more service. I got to close quick. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you for allowing us to be here today, Lord God. Your word is so wonderful to us. We thank you for giving it to us, Lord God. I pray that now that you would go before us as we leave this place, Lord, be with us throughout this week, wherever we go, to protect us and to keep us, Lord God, our homes, our children, uh, Lord God, those whom we love, Lord. Use our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. We say together. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's sing.